There we go. I got it. Okay, bear with me. Whoop. Nice background. Perfect. All right, we're good to go, Lindsay. Um, yep, all set. All right. Well, welcome everybody to today's program. I'm your host and moderator. Uh, hang on. Host and moderator, Greg Zakwitz here, and everyone can see my, my desktop and all the apps I have there, which is lovely. Uh, so we're here, if you were here before, uh, kind of the, the green room, I hope the conversation kind of goes like that. We're obviously here to talk about Apple's iOS updates, both 14.5 and the upcoming 15.1. So kind of recapping everything that we know so far. Uh, you know, the big update to the 15 is with the mail privacy protection. So what that means at the end of the day is using a mail app or iOS 15 or uh, OS Monterey device, which is supposed to come this fall. We're all saying that we're, we keep hearing September, maybe September 15th for an exact date for when this is going to roll out. But we know it's going to be fall. We know it's going right, to be right before the Q4 shopping season for a lot of brands, which is perfect timing across the board. Biggest updates is that we're not tracking opens, right? So if you're doing any sort of lifecycle marketing around based on open rates or uh, automated remails or even unengagement or re-engagement campaigns based on opener metrics, it's kind of going out the window here. So we're going to talk about what this means, what we can do to prepare now, what we can do to prepare later, and even banter about some things that we don't know yet, but like Google, and we'll figure out what's going to go on from there. So uh, as everyone knows, I've got a large group of uh, panelists, which are all smarter than I am. I can guarantee you that. So uh, rather than spending half an hour doing intros here, I'm going to go through, if everyone could just wave at the audience when I go through who you are, and then uh, when you first start talking, if you want to give a real quick intro of yourself, please feel free to. So we have uh, with us today, uh, Amy Slater. She's the head of email marketing at Visitor. So wave, Amy, thank you for being here. We have Fiona Stevens from the UK, head of marketing at Loyalty Line. Uh, uh, we have uh, Nava Hopkins, director of paid media at Just Uno. Keith Karlick, director of strategy at Overdose. Sherry Selva, VP of lifecycle marketing at Hawk Media. And then finally, we have Gabe Macaluso. He's the director of customer success here at Omnisun. So each of you guys, thank you so much for taking your time to be here today. So uh, what we were doing in the green room, I've got some questions. We've got some questions submitted prior to, we're going to have some questions during the program today as well. What we were doing in the green room and just kind of chatting about things is what I hope this presentation or this uh, webinar is. So we can address as many questions as possible. We can have a, a lively debate or discussion about how to kind of prepare for these things. And that's what I'm hoping to maintain. But I'm gonna start here. So we've talked about email open rates kind of being, uh, kind of going out the window, right? Opens are dead. I think it's important to say that, you know, if we look at the smartphone market in the US, we have Apple, which is about half of it. So we've got this share there. And then you have uh, a varying range of percentages of people that actually use the, the mail apps. So we know we don't have 100% market share. It's a good way to say it. So I'm, I'm going to kick the first question that you gave only because you're here at Omnisend. So we get the, the right to go first here. But if it's not 100% market share, Gabe, why is this such a big deal for brands out there? Yeah, um, it's not 100% market share, but it's still large. Um, I think the most recent stats showed like 48% um, market share because, you know, I mean, I use the native mail app on my iPhone. Um, and so, it, it, yeah, I mean, it's just still a large audience. You can't give up half your audience and engagement when you're looking at open metrics and not expect some changes. Um, I think it kind of already leans into what we educate our customers about when it's like, hey, there's there's multiple levels of engagement you need to look at when you're targeting and segmenting your audience. So for us, it's just like, okay, yeah, it's a little bit of a, a knee jerk reaction. It's gonna be a little punch in the gut, but opens are dead. It, you know, there's gonna be some changes happening in our reporting metrics that I think are gonna be a little bit of a like, whoa, panic button. But I, I, yeah, it, there's a big audience still. That that was a really long winded answer for what you asked, and I I get tangential sometimes because I get excited. <laughs> Were you listening to that open? It was completely, it was completely long winded. So uh, to all the panelists on today, feel free to, I'm not going to call on you all day long. So feel free to jump in with any comments you want to make to anything. I, uh, Nev, I see you raising your hand over there. So uh, feel free to jump in as you wish. And I'll go through questions to kind of facilitate the transition as well. 
Well, one thing uh, that stood out to me, um, and it's it's funny because I, I had this conversation uh, also uh, sharing my Just You Know perspective, we're, we're a zero software platform, um, that remarketing is dead with iOS 14.5. Um, and I think we humans hate change. We humans are prone to panic and drama. And what ends up happening is that we evolve and we adapt. So sure, like the what? 11.5% market share that's on actual Apple Mail, which is expressly what this is impacting. Sure, like that might be something of an issue, but there it's not known yet. And therefore we shouldn't be panicking about it. We should just be setting up our foundations and our contingency plans just in case that it would roll out to the, all the other platforms. So, or in uh, other email providers. So um, I think opens are dead is a really good click baby way of getting people to engage with a pragmatic path forward. Um, but no one in this audience should should ever have the takeaway that I am not going to be able to know who my best customers are, know what my best messagings are. Because at the end of the day, you if you have a life cycle uh, marketing strategy and retention strategy, you also probably are very cued into your actual real life sales. And you're able to see what kind of business you've driven, UTM parameters to tell you what different sources came through. So um, don't panic. I what do you think? Oh. <laughs> I was, one thing I did want to also bring up is I think a lot of people are looking and saying, hey, maybe this isn't going to affect me. Maybe I'm desktop first in terms of my audience. But we have to think wider and understand that the changes that platforms and technology are going to make, they're going to make to satisfy their wider client base. So even if you feel like I'm desktop first, this is not really going to affect my audience. There may be chan changes to your technology that will affect your audience. So it's something that everybody really has to start thinking about. I think um, the someone mentioned a few minutes ago. Well, oh, I'm in the UK. This is a, this has happened once before with GDPR. You know, the rug was pulled from under us all then. And I think the lesson we learned then was it's not something to panic about. It's an opportunity for us all to actually to improve the way we market. You know, should we actually have been placing as much emphasis on open rates as we have, or should it have been the things further down the funnel as well that we're now going to have to rely on more? So I think, yeah, the key thing for me is, is I completely agree, let's not panic, but let's look at it as, as a good opportunity to improve the messaging, improve our relationships with customers. Yeah, yeah that's kind of, so with Hawk, Sherry, Lifecycle Manager, sorry, VP of Lifecycle over here at Hawk Media, something that I've been talking to the team about is like, since we're an agency and we manage a large breadth of business, right? Like let's look at each individual client and let's just start segmenting out. Like what's the actual numbers that we're looking at for each individual client, right? Like let's not panic per, per se right now. And then once I, I keep hearing that open rates has always been considered a vanity metric. And I'm like, well, let's not go that far. We do actually use some mm -hmm. statistical significance from open rates, right? But now let's just get a little more granular and all this data that we've been collecting over time, let's really kind of dig into this. And it's, I think, a great opportunity to just shift the paradigm to be peeling back layers of the onion and being more, way more granular than we have been in the past. And, and instead of maybe depending solely on open rates for certain things like A-B tests, right, which are also going to have to change quite drastically, no more... 10, 10, 80s, right? Like we're going to have 50, 50 splits are going to have the statistical significance at this point. Um, so I think that type of paradigm shift is exciting, right? For, for our industry in particular. Yeah, I, you know, I, I've, um, I came up through the print media side of things and then you know, long year, you know, years and years ago, and then you know, threw into e-commerce that way. And, you know, and there has, you know, I mean, back in the day, you were really focused on, you know, a, driving an entire sales funnel, right? And, you know, where, and, and we could even break out like what our tactics were by, you know, where, where we're trying to drive awareness or shopping or what have you. And that hasn't changed. I mean, that it's even more true than ever. And I think that the most successful clients and projects that I've worked on is when we really embraced that, you know, that integrated funnel anyway. And, you know, and you're using a lot of data to drive that. And so again, like the, the, you know, these are technology shifts, but none of it is seismic enough that is like throwing off any of the work that we're doing. Now we're just tweaking. So, you know, ETP, ITP, 
you know, yes, we're reducing third party pixels and increasing first party data collection, but we're still doing data collection. This is going to change the way that some of, you know, somehow, you know, we're going to lose some location information based on IP, but we can embrace you know, either login forms or capturing an email through your capturing information through a logged in customer logged in session that way. So, so again, like it's not like you know, I kind of, you know, I, I read, I see a lot of the the headlines, how, you know, like open rates are dead and this and that. I just kind of don't have that knee jerk reaction because like, yes, this is a change. However, it's just not, um, you know, it's an ongoing evolution of things that we're trying to do every day by learning and iterating and, and trying new things. And so like, I think that, you know, maybe in our world when we're constantly trying to try something new anyway, that, uh, you know, we're not um, really on the hook for many years of this kind of single data point and then have the rug pulled out from under us. The, the other thing that I would add is that, you know, I really like the headline of, you know, uh, privacy theater because all of these major tech companies, primary revenue streams are from advertising. And so if you follow where they are interested in selling their product, that you we can still do a lot of the same tactics within the within these platforms. We just have to shift how we're how we're how we're doing it. I mean, I'm, I'm more in touch with Google than I am with Apple, to be perfectly honest. But the whole like flock and the data the, um, data pipe product that they just released into beta, you know, I mean, they're doing the same thing that they've always done. They're just kind of like doing it based on a Gmail login instead of you know instead of through third party pixeling. And then Apple is gonna go the same way with driving their own network. So now you're gonna have three major platforms to serve ads on Google, Facebook, and then Apple. Um, but you know, the idea that Apple is like going away in the form of like losing our ability to advertise to customers just isn't true because the revenue to Apple and advertising is just too large. So I, I think there's gonna be some things with immediate impact and then kind of like mid to long-term impact. And the mid to long-term, you mentioned it, Keith, and I think a couple other people mentioned it as well. It's like, we'll always adapt to things. There's always been changes, right? So I've been doing email marketing for 15 years, right? And it used to be bulletproof buttons and 80-20 text image ratio, right? And if they didn't enable images, you couldn't track opens back then, right? So like you've just gone through these evolutions and everything always tends to work out and settle out and marketers pivot. But you mentioned something there, Keith, which, which I want to kind of dig into. So looking at the immediate impact of, they say, email marketing and then paid media and retargeting, right? So this is where, if we think about the attendees who are on today that are uh, marketing for brands, right? What does it mean for me? And I would say that, uh, you know, from a, say, paid retargeting or something like this, right? Maybe unengagement campaigns haven't opened the last 50 emails. So let's retarget them on Facebook or Instagram or wherever, I think some of those things are going to have to pivot a little bit. So I want to I want to talk about and anyone feel free to jump in the immediate impact on like paid media and how should brands look at starting to prepare for those things now? Are there metrics they should be downloading or capturing? Are there strategies they should be testing now? And I'm not a paid media specialist, so I'm going to kick it over to uh, let's start with uh, with Nava there because she's got her hand up. Well, I, I I am prepared to yield if someone else wants it first because uh, I took it first-ish last time. <laughs> Once, twice, all right. Um, so what's actually really interesting is that, uh, I, and I mentioned it before, the remarketing is dead um, off of site visitors. Uh, we all panic, but like they're, the app platforms have come out and said, like if you have those consensual conversations, which you earn through those amazing on-site experiences, you build a great experience, um, you, you've got the, the user bond into continuing that conversation with you, that is still an absolutely valid form of remarketing. Um, it's an absolutely valid form uh, of lookalike and, and prospect audience remarketing. So just for those that, that are more on the email side and less on the, on the paid side, um, lookalike and similar audiences are where the ad platform will actually look at that user and model out people that are within a percent or within a certain percentage uh, of, of that person or of that type. So I actually, I don't necessarily see this shift necessarily changing because if the person replies and you had the email to send them, you're still going to have that email to upload into an ad platform. Like um, that said, you are going to, in order to maintain your compliance, you are gonna to need to make sure that um, your messaging and capturing that email explicitly states, I 
um, by giving me your contact information, you are signing off on us marketing to you. Um, just like with cookies, like I am expressly consenting to you having this information. So, so long as you have that language, um, there is no, like, I don't actually see this impacting paid nearly as much as flock nearly as much as 14.5, because if you had the emails to email anyway, like you would have them to upload into a remarketing list. Yeah. And, and now I really like that point you made. And I think I, I wish I'd screenshotted it because I'm going to paraphrase, but butcher this quote I saw and someone was talking about this and they, they basically said there's the difference between email audience, which are engaged people that actually want to hear from you and an email list that you keep dragging with you from provider to provider, right? Like we, we warm up client, new clients all the time. And it's like, well, I've had these people on my list for six years. I maybe haven't emailed them in the last 18 months or two years. Like now's the time to try it. And it's like, please don't like these, these people have not purchased from you, have not clicked from you. Like don't like they're, they're not worth anything. Like, and I know that we're like desperate to keep every contact on our email list possible because those are valuable, but getting that express consent is just going to enhance the performance of those contacts because they actually want to hear from your brand and they want to be engaged with you. And I think that's, that's crucial. And I think this just kind of forces everything we've always been preaching from this mindset of best practices. Yeah. And just to follow up on that, I think that's a great point is understanding your audience too. I mean, we all obviously have a lot of benchmarks out there. This is a great engagement window. This is a great open window, but it's going to be so different across verticals. Um, across demographics, across whatever you're, it's going to be indicative of what your cadence and frequency is. So understanding what that engagement window for your audience is, is going to be huge moving forward as well, because you're going to get a sense of that. So for, for my brand, is it that in the first 90 days, that's when we're seeing the most activity and then there's a drop off, or is it 180 days or is it 47 days? Just like right now, while you're having all of that data, get a sense of your audience, not just your email list. So I think that was a great way of putting it, Gabe. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm in full agreement with that. I mean, the, the idea, you know, you can't operate these platforms in a silo. I mean, you know, and, it, you know, we, we acknowledge a multi-touch point world. So <clears throat> independent of how many touch points you think are going to happen before someone buys that, you know, the, the, I think the requirement is that you have, you know, shared data modeling across, you know, your entire marketing program. So that way that you're able to Kind of understand where things um, or where customers are engaging or purchasing, and I mean even you know taking that to on-site and thinking about personalization or personalized messaging. I mean things like that. All of that stuff becomes you know m to me much more important and much more important metrics than like open rate. Um, you know I agree open rate is a good indicator of like list engagement, but you know I, I I'm way more interested in. Um, what happens next versus when I am, you know, seeing if somebody's going to open an email on their phone or not. So I want to, I want to circle back to this, uh, Amy and Keith, you both mentioned it a second ago. So I don't want to shift away, but I want to get to what you just talked about Keith here. So I'm going to, I'm going to kind of pivot around and then circle back. So I apologize to the audience and to you guys. Uh, you mentioned that Opens have always been around, right? We, it's something that we mentioned. Some people look at it as vanity metric. Some people look at it more so uh, as a defining metric. There's certainly, there's always these other metrics too. Click rates, conversion rates, click-through rates, right? Clicked open rates, whatever it might be. They've always been there. So what, even though they've always been there, the focus still always has, has always come down to like, what's my open rate? Can I do subject line testing? How do I increase my open rates? And, and I get it. There's I've never put a whole lot of stock in open rates. I've put some into it. I think from a re-engagement deliverability standpoint, it's more of an indicator, but like, mm -hmm. I don't care if I get a hundred percent open rate, if no one clicks and, you know, if I'm segmenting to a list of 200 people or a segment of 200 people and I get a hundred percent open rate and I get no clicks, right. It's 200 people, right. And the rest of my audience doesn't have anything. So there's ways to massage that. If clicks and conversions have always been there, I guess this is, for brands, why should they be focusing on that more now than maybe they have before? Is that really just learning, uh, a shifting mindset, not learning something new, but is it just a shift in mindset we need to push now to make open rates a little bit less, uh, maybe I don't say less important, but less impactful than maybe we should have been giving them credit for before? 
Because it seems like, I, I mean, based on everything you see and everyone I was talking about, the shift is now going to click rates. Click rates going to be that defining metric where open rates were that defining metric before. Like we're shifting further down, down the funnel now. Is it, do we think it's just a, a new mindset people have to have? I, I kind of think about it maybe a little bit differently in that even with a click rate, that is a good indicator of, you know, audience intention within a list. However, it does not indicate or provide me confidence in what they're going to do next. So, you know, for me with email, I'm, I'm way more in, interested in on-site engagement after a click than I am with the click itself. So, so when I, so when I look at open and click, I'm kind of, you know, that that's an indicator to me is like, you know, does this list have enough people on it that are actually going to open a message? And that kind of, you know, validates like yes or no, you know, is, you know, um, do I actually have an audience here? But that doesn't tell me like the health of the audience or what their intent is, or, you know, am I sending them interesting messages or any, or anything else, you know, like a, even if I were to have a, 100% click rate, but if I have a 90% bounce rate on the page that I land them on, that's just as, uh, that's the same way, same thing as having like a very low click rate. So, you know, the, like the next three, five steps or engagement metrics or conversion metrics, however the site is being optimized around, I think are of uh, equal or greater importance than even what the click is. And, you know, and I think that, uh, that opens kind of in the same boat is that, you know, that's great if you have a hundred percent open rate, but you're right. If you, if you only have a 2% click rate, then what's the point? Um, and, but so like open and click, I think are good indicator metrics, but they're not super meaningful to me as compared to, you know, the follow-up on-site metrics that, that happen after. So you seg me, you segued me all the way back here. So I appreciate that because um, I was having this, this email conversation very briefly with Amy yesterday around tech stack. Right, and I think everyone so far today has mentioned this, and I know Fiona, you're with Loyalty Lion, right? So you, we've got loyalty programs, and we've got all these different systems working together. So to your point, Keith, I get the email, I open it, I click it, I get to the website. Now what, right? So do I have to have certain monitoring, uh, you know, monitoring systems, or how am I tracking that and then tying that back to the email and tying that back to the ultimate customer experience, which I think Sherry, you mentioned before as well, right? How do we improve that experience here? So Amy, I'm going to, I'm going to toss you a softball here because we were chatting about this briefly yesterday, but like, should people be auditing their tech stack right now and figuring out, okay, this, the, these are the holes I need to kind of go through the customer experience and make that, that experience a little bit better. What should people be doing with their tech stack now to prepare for this, this change? Yeah. So I definitely, I think it's twofold. I think that first people should be having conversations with their platforms and their technologies, not just with your ESPs, but also any other email adjacent technology, because we're talking about these global changes that are gonna happen, but each individual platform is gonna have specific pieces of their technology that are gonna be impacted. Are you on an ESP that uses open data as part of its revenue attribution? If you are, how are they gonna make those changes? What are the changes gonna look like in terms of analytics? Um, and also something that we saw with GDPR, do you, are you working with a loyalty program or are you look, working with a restock program or somebody that has an email component, but maybe that's not their biggest the biggest part of their business are they preparing the way that they need to and just making sure that you have a really good understanding of how all of your partners your acquisition partners analytics cdp esps how they are preparing for this shift so that you have an understanding of that so that's like what looking at okay this is what's happening today but then also to your point looking to see like all right where now that i'm looking at all of this where are the gaps what analytics am i not catching um, is there something that I should be tracking a little bit better on site? Is there something I need to do in terms of acquisition, um, which we talked about earlier, to make sure that I'm able to collect more of this data and use it? Um, do I need a CPP? But these are a lot of really great questions right now in terms of expanding the data that you can use. Excellent. Thanks, Amy. And Fiona, I'm going to kick it to you real quick uh, because she mentioned loyalty programs in here. So obviously your niche there. Anything specific if someone has a loyalty program or has been considering a loyalty program and they're like, uh, you know, do I, put, do I hit pause right now? What would you advise here from like a program standpoint, a functionality standpoint to that would be impacted by this? Yeah. I mean, I think there's two, two sides of it. There's the 
the, the direct kind of activity and then there's the indirect. And um, if you were thinking about loyalty or you have a loyalty program, it's definitely not the time to, to press pause because you need to be building relationships and building up trust with people. You know, this, this whole iOS 14.515, it's all about trust with brands and your loyalty program is a really good vehicle to be building that. So I definitely wouldn't say pause. I also think it, there are, you can track engagements in a lot of different ways with the loyalty program. So yeah, you won't have your open rates, but there's lots of different emails outside of newsletters and things that we forget about. So what about review prompts? How, you know, the open rate of a review prompt is less important than how many reviews you're actually getting out at the bottom. Same thing with, you know, um, Lord's program welcome emails, getting your brand values across in that email so that people really understand that they align as a brand and they really want to join your program or reward available reminders. They've got a reward. Again, the open rate less important and how many people are actually engaging with the program and redeeming that reward. So I think um, the beauty of the Lord's program is not just the trust and the relationships, but also it, it gives you another way of measuring the engagement with your active and actually the most valuable customers. I guess if you look at the email funnel, you, with all your marketing, you wanna be focusing your effort where you're gonna see the greatest return. So actually it's not the people that open the email that matter, it's the people that, that click through and as Keith said, that then go on to convert. So I think it's, as I said before, it's a bit of an opportunity really to, to shift your focus to, to the most valuable customers. Yeah, it's kind of like what I touched on earlier, right? Like gathering all this information now and a loyalty program is a fantastic way to do that. Like, where are they clicking? When do they click? Did they convert? Did they not convert? Did they come back to the email, click another link? Like, there's so many ways and, and that we can look at this in a, in a bigger aspect instead of a little narrow. I think maybe in the past or currently, sometimes marketers think just like this. But with loyalty and then with this new feature rollout, it's kind of forcing us to like spread our wings a little bit and, and open up and look at the 50,000 foot view in a different way, right? Like there's so many metrics we could be collecting now before this rolls out so that maybe um, our Apple users aren't affected as much, right? If we, if we have, for example, if we have purchase history, we probably have locations. So let's make sure we grab that and keep that segment that so we can continue for specific types of segmentation or remarketing campaigns that we want to uh, focus on. So I think being smart about the data points that you currently have, um, start collecting that and start building that now before you know September comes and we may not have that option anymore. And I think a loyalty program is a great way to do that. I think also with your Just Uno, like start putting in some creative ways to grab additional information right from the start if you can. If not, maybe your vertical isn't that aggressive, throw it in the welcome series somewhere. Like this is gonna be, a, I think a really fun time for marketers to really think outside of the box and get creative in ways of collecting data. I, I completely really agree. Sorry, just, I think there's also ways you can use loyalty program to incentivize that data collection, you know, give people points if they take a quiz that gives you a little bit of that information or, you know, um, things like birthday rules can be adapted to just get those kind of tidbits that will help you personalize your experiences a lot more and still keep your emails performing really well. A thousand percent. And, and what's really interesting and the hugest of shout outs to, to Hawk Media, because I, I know you guys are champions at this. And if, if there's one lesson that I think we, we all could take away, um, this is the perfect time to get other facets of your marketing department tuned in to this so that we can all come together and collaborate on and fill in those gaps. Um, because if it's just in retention world, you're, you're, you're gonna be spinning your gears. You're always gonna be stubbing your toe. Whereas if you start pulling in your analytics team, your data analysis team, you start pulling in your paid media team, you start pulling in um, even like your, your finance and ops, um, the more you can build cross department um, empathy and sympathy into what data is available now, what data is gonna be available in the future and how you can benchmark effectively so that you're not held accountable for things that in, in like the old world state as opposed to the new world state, um, the easier it will be to actually scale your programs. Um, one of the, the things that I, I actually found really fascinating, even thinking about the iOS 14.5 um, and, and, and how that impacted is that there were some brands that were actually 
not only perfectly unaffected, they actually improved their performance once that launched. Um, and, and it was the brands that kind of got complacent and comfortable in just the same tactics over and over and over again that didn't branch out. So um, it's not just about honoring your customers. It's also about honoring your internal team and your brand and getting your whole brand along for that journey. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point is that, you know, folks that were to your point around, you know, the 14.5, I think the, the largest impact that I've seen with merchants are folks that were fully reliant on advertising with third party pixels, right? If you had your entire, you know, acquisition program based on, you know, DSPs, you know, you had very little email or, or direct marketing, you had, um, you know, maybe you know, on site, whatever, but the, your, your entire acquisition was built around, you know, uh, pay to play, you know, search, especially if you're embracing Facebook at a really high level, that hurt for sure. Um, and like those people had a lot of shifting to do, you know, of merchants and clients that we have that already were, you know, focusing on first party data collection or, you know, like what you're talking about leveraging, you know, cross departmental information to drive or understand customer intent, you know, to drive CLV or, or RPV or, you know, having a, you know, embracing email SMS is like first party, um, you know, marketing compared to others or loyalty or what have you. They were impacted at a much smaller rate because like the, that third party, you know, data serving was just such a small component of their entire program. And so yes, there was a shift, but it wasn't like, you know, seismic. And, and I kind of feel the same way with the Apple release is that yes, there will be a shift. Yes, we are gonna lose a few data points like location and stuff like that. However, you know, if you haven't, you know, really doubled down on having like a fully integrated marketing approach and you're you know, still marketing in silos where my email does this one thing, advertising does this one thing, loyalty does this one thing and none of the stuff is talking to each other, it's still gonna hurt, right? That you're gonna see a larger impact to, to your overall. So let me ask you guys this, your experience with the updates to 14.5, where you said, hey, if you were just kind of status quo, you probably got dinged more than those who are being a little more proactive with it. Does this upcoming change, knowing that from what you've seen so far, does this upcoming change going to make that gap even wider, or is it just a different type of change? I think it's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here because... There was a lot of good conversation, so I want to kind of try to consolidate everything we've been sharing because <laughs> this is like a masterclass. It's great. Um, so, and I and I saw the question from Anupa in the in the in the chat as well, talking about loyalty. And you know, Fiona, like I always tell the story of Starbucks, right? Like I only go to Starbucks when I travel, but I open every single email I get from Starbucks because I'm like, what's my loyalty level, right? Or like Delta Sky Miles, and like I've got a flight booked, and I'm like counting down the days before I actually get on an airplane because it's been so long. But the reason that those loyalty programs and those emails are so relevant is because, you know, with those loyalty signups and you touched on it, birthday, kid's birthday, anniversary dates, like all these key data points that you can leverage. Where's your closest Starbucks store? Where's like, so we get GOIP, we get geolocation and we're, we're collecting all of this information. So, you know, tying all of that in and it's easy, it, it's easy for us to forget that some of the folks on the call that are listening into us like they're the person that are handling everything, right? So when we talk about like all these department needs to come together, it's like all the different parts of your brain need to like have a, have a meeting together and say, okay, where do I focus my efforts? And Keith, you talked about it a little bit ago where you said, you know, we, we don't send emails for opens, right? We send emails for engagement and revenue. No one designs an email and goes, man, I really hope I get a 20% open rate on this like and get no dollars, right? The goal is revenue. That's the ultimate KPI is, am I generating sales from this? So again, I do full circles. This is what I do because I get really excited and there was a lot of good information. So I'm trying to narrow, navigate all of it. But, you know, Greg, back to your question is, you know, what do these changes mean? It's, hey, the changes are beta now. They're in September, right ahead of Black Friday and Cyber Monday, which we're already talking to our customers about, hey, how's your holiday planning going? Because they have to think about all that stuff. So now here's just another thing that you can implement. But the beauty of these things, if you really set up these automated engagements through loyalty, through retargeting, abandoned cart, abandoned browse, abandoned product emails, refill reminders, and you can kind of start, regardless of your product line, if you can start thinking about how do consumables market to me and start implementing those strategies, if you kind of lay that groundwork, when all of this stuff gets rolled out officially, 
like you've already got the foundation and you've already got the revenue streams rolling. Yeah, I have full agreement with that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think, yeah. And I think loyalty think is one of the things that ends up siloed very, very often. And yeah. it, there's such a missed opportunity. It can tie into pretty much every across the board, um, but it often ends up as the thing that kind of gets managed just when there's a bit of time or it doesn't fully connect and it's it, it can power any part of your digital strategy. This is exactly why I love working in an agency, right? I have all these different channels right at my yeah. fingertips. I'm like, oh, let's talk to the SEO team. Let's talk to Paige. Let's connect the dots. <laughs> this is the fun part, you know, where you really, again, like I know I keep saying, like thinking from a, a bigger point of view, like if you start doing this now and you start setting up this foundation, this rollout will not have as hard of an impact as you're probably freaking out about right now. Um, just It's just about laying those foundations down and now and collecting the data and developing these really intriguing and engaging uh, email campaigns, as well as automations, as well as loyalty programs. It's just kind of connecting all the dots. And then once all that's going, check out your site activity. Like, how are they clicking to the site? When are they clicking to the site? Are they bouncing? Are they hanging? Are they converting? It's just compiling all that data. So start practicing that now. You know, start looking at, hey, okay, if I send this email on Tuesday and by Friday I've, you know, converted 10 grand, where, where was that 10 grand? Was it on a specific product? Was it on a category page? Was the, the bounce rate bad on one of the products that I thought was going to be great? Did a product fall out of stock? Like there's all sorts of information that you can start connecting dots on. One quick note. Um just to be empathetic to, to all the, the, the various perspectives that are out there. Um, if you're in SMB land, as opposed to say enterprise land or, or scale land, um, this, this can feel like it's a lot and, and, and a lot might be on your plate or a lot might be with various things. The, the one thing I would actually um, in, encourage you to explore is there is a certain threshold where depending on your size and scale, the ad platforms, uh, the, the email channel platforms, uh, they're actually evolving towards making life very, very simple for the SMB. So I, and this, this might be a bit of a controversial um, opinion, but from a, prag a pragmatist standpoint, if you, are, if you are of a certain size, a lot of these changes are actually evolving so that you can just focus on you and your business as opposed to the, the various technical creative big things. Um, and, uh, and as you grow, you can then take those tasks back um, and or delegate them to a trusted vendor uh, or, or higher up in, into your org. So it's, I, I realize that we've got very technical today um, and there's a lot of action items and there's a lot of tools that you can explore. Um, I, I would just point out a, a lot of the platforms have made it their mission, especially after COVID and, and the pandemic how can we make life easier? And we can all be cynical about like, what does that mean? And like the future of our industry, blah, 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 blah. Um, but the good news is for SMBs, if, if you are of a certain size, a lot of these changes actually mean it's less work for you. And then as you grow, you can take advantage of all these really great technical strategies. So, so Nava, I think that's a really good point. And, you know, it seems like a really big change, but let's just calm down and, you know, think about Hey, it can make us better. Think about how it applies. Let me do this because we talked about technical stuff and we talked about, hey, we should do this and this. And people might listening might think, well, it's a lot of information. How do I process it? What does it mean for me? I want to go to each person, which this might take 20 minutes, but I want to go to each person and uh, it, by all means, give the advice based on your either what you think is most important, your core competency, how you work with clients or what the questions they're asking you. So fit it. We purposely put a panel with a variety of views today for this specific reason. So Gabe, I'm going to start with you. Just give everyone else time to prepare because I know you already have something uh, you can spit out here. But if you had to do one or two things today, this week or next week to start preparing, like what are those things you would recommend them do? Yeah. And I, I mean, this is, I, I like... I do have lots of things. I'm like, I could speak for 18 <laughs> minutes and give everyone else too. Like, I should have, I should have ended with you. <laughs> no, 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 just kidding. Um, I, I would say if I, if I'm in a, if I'm in, if I'm sitting in the driver's seat and I have to make a decision today, what I'm probably going to look at is a combination of 
making sure I have some sort of loyalty program where I'm collecting additional information and tying in omni-channel marketing to that. Um, and one of the things that none of us have addressed, and as I'm staring at a brick on my desk, I'm like, this could hit me in the head, is SMS, right? Like SMS has never relied on open rates. Um, it's only click rates in terms of engagement there. The opt-in policies for SMS have always been stricter. So we've like SMS channel is growing at a more mature rate than email still is, it's lagging, right? Email is kind of, it's always there. It's always going to be the most successful. It's always going to drive the highest ROI, but it's always going to be lagging because you still have people that are, you know, offering to sell you lists and, and old, there's still the old school people out there because no one's been in it long enough to educate the next generation, but SMS and, and looking at omni-channel experience and just kind of combining those two things. And Sherry touched on it as well. Like when you think about multiple channel, you know, touches, right? So do I send an SMS to my VIP audience and say, hey, this new release is coming and you're going to be the first to know about? Or do I send an email saying, hey, this new release is coming. If you want to be the first to know about it, sign up for our SMS. Here's a landing form where I'm collecting your SMS opt-in, but I'm also collecting first name, last name, location, birthday, right? Because they want to be in the club. And so you can really kind of play those channels against each other and, and, and you know, give that unique personal touch in that communication channel. Excellent. Uh, Sherry, I'm going to kick it to you next. Um, okay. Can you guys see me? Okay. Cause you're all frozen. <laughs> I can see you. Okay, great. Yeah, so I can I'm, too. I'm still, I'm still moving and I'm not just stuck in a weird, awkward pose. Um, so for me on my side, because we deal with, um, small to mid-sized businesses, we have, um, a lot of handholding that we're preparing for. And part of that is kind of what I touched on earlier. Like, okay, let's take a look at the database that you've got right now. Like, let's see where you're at right now. And so my team, and I know the other teams across the channels are really focusing on helping to educate our clients um, about how we're gonna help get them through this process by starting with, let's, let's look at what our segment size looks like. Is it half your database? Is it three quarters of your database? Is it all of your database, right? Depending on your vertical, it might be. Um, so that's where we're gonna start first. Second, as an agency, kind of touches on what um, Greg had spoken about earlier, like how do we shift the paradigm from open rate to click through? Like talking about what we can get from these click through rates um, and how in a sense it's gonna be better for them, um, how we can help align better with different strategies and automations and flows to collect data now. Like I, like I spoke about earlier, I know that's three things. I'm sorry, I kind of jumped in too. So it would be that, it would be like first, you know, helping calm the waves a little bit and saying like, okay, this is the actual segment size that we're looking at for your business. This is how the click-through rates are going to help. And now let's really dive into your email strategies and build out more robust um, uh, flows and automations now to help collect that data so that we, we have a better foundation. Very good. Amy, kick it to you. One or two things and only two. No, I'm just joking, Sherry. <laughs> Information is much better than a number. I'm just teasing you. Know? <laughs> uh, one thing I will say is, when we're talking about all of this is, you know, the, obviously privacy is such a huge part of, of what's happening here. But one of the other areas that we need to think about is, is mobile. So for a long time, open rates have been changing anyways because of the mobile experience. Five years ago, we were saying there's a shift to mobile. Obviously, that's the norm now. And that means that things have been changing in terms of people casually browsing while they're in the car, while they're waiting online at the grocery store, at bed at night before they go to sleep. But maybe they're browsing without that intent to purchase. So um, as a lot of people have mentioned here, what we really need to do is start looking at the, those points that are just more indicative of the intent of the contact versus some of this like aggregate data. So looking at click rates, when people are clicking, looking at conversion rates. Um, I'm a big fan of, you know, revenue per delivery, because that also tells me a lot about the cadence of the cadence is what we're doing correct in terms of these promotions. Um, so the only other thing that I would recommend is going through and just getting super familiar with your baseline metrics and tagging content profiles and enriching the data that you have right now with information that's going to be missing soon. So, um, you know, with our clients right now, again, you know, to, to Sherry's point, we are doing some hand holding, we are doing some explaining, um, but we're also doing a super deep dive. We want to know that information inside and out. So this is kind of fun because no one knows who I'm going to pick next. I'm actually just going on my screen based on your order here. So who it is next, uh, uh, Keith, why don't, why don't you jump in next Keith if you can. Sure. Um, you 
I think it's really about personalized messages, personalized personalization and creating engaging content. Sorry, I had a little trouble getting that out. Um, you know, and that's across the tech stack, that's across content, you know, is that if you send a message that someone is interested in, they will open it. If you send them, you know, spray and pray garbage, then they're not going to open it, um, you know, independent of, you know, of technology or anything else. And so I think that, you know, and this applies to enterprise and down to SMB. There are plenty of small brands that we all love that we want that we shop with constantly that you know may not have huge marketing budgets, but are killing it because they're doing a great job with product and messaging. And at the same time, you have plenty of enterprise companies that are doing a terrible job with it because they're on legacy email platforms or whatever, and it takes them you know 50 hours of work time to send an email. So you know, I think that you know. So if, if, if brands can focus on what's important to a customer um, and then you know, create product and messaging that, that you know, supports that, they will create a loyal audience. And then you know, also being at an agency, this is where agencies can help you out is like getting your tech stack in order. But you know, there's a lot more work to get a brand able to talk about themselves in a positive way and pushing out content that, that you know, creates the audience than it is to put a tech stack together that, you know, um, that executes. I mean, between, you know, Just Uno and Loyalty Lion and Omnisend and Big Commerce and Shopify and looking at all these SaaS platforms, I mean, a lot of this stuff is 80% plug and play at this point from an executional standpoint, which really frees up teams to be, you know, you know focusing on, you know, the, the the messaging side of it. And I think that's more important than ever because, you know, where in the past we might've been able to overcome, um, you know, maybe poor messaging or lackluster messaging with, you know, frequency and data collection, as that goes away um, or becomes a little bit more difficult then you know, wh what we're gonna have left is making sure that we're just building strong relationships with end customers. Very good. Uh, Fiona, I'm gonna kick it over to you now. Yeah, um, I, I think for me, the, the first most important thing is, um, I remember when GDPR was, I have to be a bit careful with what I recommend here because when GDPR hit, my inbox got flooded with messages. Things are changing, you have to opt in or everything, you're gonna never speak to us again and all these kind of messages from, from brands. So I'm not saying do that, but I would say you've got a, a window here to use what the emails that you can to understand who you're most valuable customers are and then understand which messages are resonating with them and then whether you're enterprise or a small business focus your attention and your efforts on those most valuable customers so i would i would recommend using a this period before the change happens but b ahead of black friday cyber monday to you know do some testing I, look at the emails that you've sent in the past look at the emails you're going to send in the next two months and use it to really figure out who are your most valuable customers and what messages resonate with them. And then I would say, look at the great thing about open rates, right? It was a, it was a feedback loop. You have got a very immediate idea of what resonated with someone or what didn't. So how can you use your loyal customer community to replicate that feedback loop? If you've got a community of customers on Facebook, you could be testing messages with them. If you've got you know, a really trusted VIP group of customers, you can test things verbally or in focus groups and things with them. I think it was a great feedback channel and a very instant one, so, but think about how you can use your customer community and your loyal customers to replicate that feedback. Wonderful. And last but not least, Nava, floor is yours. So I, I echo everything that was just said. Uh, there's, no, there's no need for a community anything. Um, Two, two big thoughts. Um, thought number one, just as much as it's important to do the A-B testing now uh, with, with your subject lines, with, with your messaging, I strongly encourage you to build in time uh, to speak with your CS and sales organizations if, if they exist. Um, and or, uh, again, uh, it was a brilliant point, Fiona, checking your, your Facebook page, your, your Google My Business, like looking at those reviews. Um, no one will feel bad marketing emails more ardently than CS and sales and or the groups that, that feel like they're being hounded or feel like the messagings aren't quite right. And so, so long as your sales uh, and, and your CS organizations are, are plugged into that marketing, that is the holy trifecta 
of star power. Um, the moment that all three are really tied into what who the customer personas are, what works, what doesn't, uh, how that revenue is translating, what that customer journey looks like, you're golden. Um, if any of those three are not cued in, you are setting yourself up to have some sort of gap that is going to cause you some degree of pain. Um, the other thing I, I strongly recommend, um, and this is more me just bringing back a bit of history from the paid uh, world when um, customer match, so Google's customer list uh, solution uh, went from being free for everyone to you had to have $50,000 of lifetime spend. There's a very, very, very short window where people could get it, apply for it and get grandfathered in. Um, and then the moment that window hit, it's since been a headache and a half uh, to get new accounts uh, whitelisted for it. If, if you do nothing else from this, this webinar, set up A-B tests now um, to then potentially test within like the next month or so, so long as your, your um, campaigns uh, won't be negatively impacted and, and really make the most of this month. Like as soon as you get off this webinar, set, set those, those A-B tests up because it's you, you have this window, that window will go away and it might spiral into other things. Very good. I appreciate everyone's uh, thoughtfulness with the answers as well. And we're used to cats and dogs in the background. We got people in, uh, in Navas over there. So uh, it's kind of funny. So uh, we got a couple of questions. We only have a couple of minutes left here, but we did get a couple of questions prior to the, uh, the program today. A lot of those questions were things about, we were talking about before, it's kind of speculation. We don't, it's kind of a wait and see. We'll see what happens in a few months and what the ramifications are. One of them, however, is around what Gabe mentioned before is around SMS. And I think this applies to what you might've talked about before as well, Keith, with uh, how list growth might change and tactics around list growth might change and you know, collecting SMS at sign up, but obviously never buy a list, but do you guys foresee any sort of tactics or fundamental changes to growing email, SMS, whatever opt-in lists in the future? I see Keith nodding, but I'll, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it's crucial to have a welcome series, right? Like, you know, I, I, it, when we look at stats and stuff and we look at automations, we know welcome series and abandoned cart always generate the most revenue via email. 100% always those top two. And yet I think still like half of the stores online don't have either of those set up. And a welcome series is, you know, the first opportunity you have to build that brand loyalty and start building engagement and telling your story. Like, Anybody from, you know, someone doing $1,000 and they've, you know, processed their first order on their Shopify site all the way to someone who's now running a $100 million business, they got into that business because they had a story to tell. And a welcome series is just that. You get to tell your story. You get to, gener you get to put out your brand voice out there so people start building that brand loyalty and, and start understanding what you guys are about. I think what we'll see is, you know, maybe extended welcome series. So where typically we say, okay, three, three messages is a good place to start. Maybe we start stretching that out to like a 10 message welcome series where it's really about nurturing and educating the people on the brand. And then after they're done through that automation, if they still haven't purchased or they haven't clicked on any of those emails, then it's like, okay, get rid of them. They're done for like, don't even worry about keeping them on your list. Maybe we push them over to Facebook and we start doing social retargeting and try to engage them through that channel. But just to put them on your email list, just to send them emails, because I think that's going to be really where we see like, I think we'll see emails come on the list, but maybe the life of the email address on a list is going to be shorter. I think with SMS, you know, we just had the whole shaft law come into play, which again, tied our hands for, I don't know, what is this, the 10th time with SMS messaging. Um, so we're all, we're all very familiar with working within pretty tight constraints with SMS. But one thing that um, we do at Hawk with our ESPs like OmniSend is we are really good at combining, yes, the welcome series and the abandoned cart, but then also developing co-branded like email SMS messaging to help with that list growth. Um, and we've seen some pretty good, you know, return on investment for our clients in doing things like that, which kind of touches base with how we work with Just Uno and other loyalty programs as well. So, I mean, don't be afraid to get creative with, with your SMS side of the business either, because there's, there are folks, especially on the mobile, right, that are going to only want to do SMS and they don't like email. So don't be afraid to dip a toe into that pool. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, um, the, you know, thinking back a few years, like there was a Castle Act in Canada, which really focused on explicit opt-in. And, you know, and so we, I mean, that's kind of when we started 
um, really kind of doubling down on, you know, on having that explicit, explicit permission from customers. So SMS is kind of the same way. So I think, you know, for each audience is going to be a little bit different, but like we're testing uh, sign up forms on like order success pages and other like, you know, low or, or pages on the site that, that don't really count highly towards conversion where we can, you know, show like pop up messaging and stuff like that without risk of exit. Um, and that's, you know, showing to be successful, but, you know, it, it is kind of a little bit of a different, um, you know, opt-in scenario than email uh, or SMS is a little bit of a different opt-in scenario than email. So I think that you, know, everyone's still trying to figure out kind of what that, like, how do you capture SMS at the same rate that you're capturing email? One thing uh, I'll, I'll throw out there on, on the just, you know, front, we've, we've seen that um, having that two-step can actually be very powerful. So whether it's a spin to win or scratch off or whatever um, gamification play you want to do that the, the person can get a double win if they give you that double information and like getting that person in the habit of chaining their yeses. Um, it's a sales tactic, like you, you chain yeses. Mm -hmm. So if you can, um, they've already begun that process of, of feeding in Yes, I, I want my I want my discount. Yes, here's my email. Yes, here's my phone. It's a lot easier to get it as opposed to leading with the phone. Because I agree, like yep. my phone is spam to all nonsense. It is the worst. I ignore every brand that um, messages me because I've been overloaded. Um, but when the person consents to that to both fronts, not only do you get to message on both channels, you also have enhanced targeting on the paid side. So get the habit in the user of chaining those yeses, get the habit of the user in the habit of giving both. I think the, 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 I think the, the common theme today is, you know, you just mentioned a second ago, but it's like tying these systems together, right? Tying the experiences together. So you mentioned Keith, hey, we're testing these things out on, you know, on pages where it's not going to really impact the conversion rate so much. But having the SMS and the email now feeds other channels and everything is connected here and the loyalty programs and things like that. So I think it's a good call to action for, you know, it's not even a wake up call, but a good call to action for people to just sit back and look at their own programs and say, okay, what are we missing here? What do we have? What works well? How do we need to rejigger things or rethink about things and just focus on the experience. And if you deliver a good experience for your customers, they'll love you for it. They'll open your emails, whether you can track it or not, they'll open it. They'll see them, right? Hopefully they click and then convert through their so uh, there's a conversation. I don't think we have time for it today unless you guys want to go over here, but there's a few questions around, and this is more things that we don't know with the long-term impact, but around the lack of open rate uh, messaging or open rate tracking and how that plays into inbox deliverability versus bulk mail deliverability and, and things like that. Do you guys want to stick around for an extra minute just to kind of talk about this for a couple minutes or do we want to, do we want to stop? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Yep. See, I chain yeses there. Like that. Uh, all right, so let, let's, I don't need to re-ask the question, but there are multiple questions around like, what does this mean for Gmail? What does this mean for knowing if your list is clean and having those open rates go down, not having insight into it and then finding yourself bulk folder, right? It's not the end all be all, but it is a significant deliverability issue here. Anyone want to throw out any wild ideas or uh, or gut feels about what this is going to mean? And you know, we look back six, nine, twelve months from now. Um, I would say, you know, try to try to build some segments that are really, really similar to what you already have in terms of content count when you're including open data, because there is a lot of that data that is. Uh, that works together in a package. So, you know, maybe you have to start retweaking your click, your on-site activity, your purchase data to try to get to a segment that approximates what you had before. Um, I think we're still waiting to find out how ISPs are going to react, how they're going to change their algorithms, what proxy opens are going to mean as opposed to, you know, it, it, we know that it's not just all going to go on open. So what is that going to look like? Um, and then the other thing I would say is your spam rate is it's like the open rates, evil twin, um, your spam complaint, your unsubscribe rates. If you're seeing those go up, then like steadily, not just a spike because of the campaign, then you're probably seeing yourself entering into that deliverability bad place that you would have been with the, the low opens, what the low opens would have indicated. If you had to place a bet one way or the other, two sides of the table, this will impact, uh, this will kind of remove open rates as, uh, a substantial monitoring metric for an ISP versus now they're still going to do it. Where would you put your money? 
<laughs> it's a great thing. You could be you could be wrong, and it doesn't matter, right? But uh, I think that there's going to be a grace window um, where we're not going to see things dinged as badly um, with the open rate changes, and then I think that the ISPs will probably remove that from or put de-emphasize it within their algorithm. Yeah, you'd like to think so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, I think I think that we're going to see further siloing with them the you know for deliverability within isps like as an example you know chrome and gmail you're already seeing deliverability act more like um you know more play along the rules of like seo based on how the prioritized inbox within gmail um and so you know like deliverability is affected there if emails are going into one of those tabs it's not your primary your you know your open rates a lot lower I think that your know, folks that are using email clients, whether it's like mail or Outlook or things like that, that's software, that'll probably be less of an issue. But you know, probably the web-based tools, it's going to be, you know, I think further siloing where we're going to you know, have to cater email for um, you know for each kind of inbox, basically. And I think you know this ties into everything we've been saying, but like the clients we work with, you know. If I have a client sending a hundred thousand contact list and they're getting, you know, an eight percent open rate, if I can convince them, like, hey, let's let's narrow this segment down, like, just send it to twenty five thousand of your most engaged users, looking at purchase behavior, click behavior, mm -hmm. opt in behavior, and let's ignore opens. Like, most of the time, they'll see an increase in revenue, or they'll see the same number of clicks. So that's something you got. I kind of challenge all the people on the call, like kind of start segmenting on that, look at purchase behavior, look at those those or logics, if you will. So have they opened in the last number of days? Have they clicked in the smaller window? Have they purchased, you know, kind of thing. And, and really kind of narrow that down a little bit. And just, we, you know, Nava talked about like A-B testing, do your own A-B test and just send to the smaller audience. And you, I, I would put money on it. <laughs> you can contact me, I'll put money on it. Um, if I'm wrong, I'll give you a credit to your Omnisend account. If you're an Omnisend user, I've got that power. I'll do it. I'll put the money's out there. Um, we'll figure out what that credit is. But the idea being like, you're going to see either the same number of clicks or more clicks. You're going to see this more revenue. And so you've just made your entire marketing process more efficient because you're not just creating noise, right? The goal is revenue. The goal is engagement, not just, can I send it to as many people as possible? Let's really kind of focus it and get it to the people that want to see it. You're here. That is probably the number one conversation we have with clients once we sign them on, because they're so used to the, we call it the shotgun approach, you know, yep. just let's see, something's going to hit. And they're used, they think that that's the, you know, they're, they're, they're so used to seeing that as like, oh, well, this is the money driver. We're, we're consistently making this much money. And so it's a, it's a challenging conversation at first. To say, but you know what, we can make even more by sending yeah. the less and being yeah. more strategic. And that kind of like scares folks a little bit. So I, I encourage you guys out there, don't be scared because what Gabe is talking about is probably going to generate you, I don't want to put a percentage on it, but yeah. a larger percentage of revenue. <laughs> <Get a> percentage. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I think it's a good way to sum it up is that regardless of the size of company you are, one person, you know, all encompass team to, you know, 20, it, this is manageable. This is very doable. I think it's just a matter of working within your confines, ask questions where you can get the resources, but this is, uh, we'll adapt to this just as easily as we adapt to everything else. Maybe not GDPR, but just as easy <laughs> as everything else, uh, Real quick, I'm going to go the opposite direction as the questions I asked before, so I'll lead you in here. Uh, while we wrap up here, I always like asking for people's contact information verbally, whether it's you or just your company website, how people can find you. But let's verbally call this out, and we'll start with you this time, Nava, if you would. Uh, sure. So uh, come check out Justino, uh, justino.com. Uh, you also, uh, if you have PPC questions, uh, you can hit me up on Twitter at NavaF. Uh, and hashtag uh, ask PPC. I do a monthly column for a search engine journal. Uh, and then of course you can uh, follow uh, and get a CRO advice uh, on LinkedIn and Twitter from the Justino you know social handle. Wonderful, and Fiona? Yep, um, so Law to Land generally, we're at lawtoland.com, but also on all the social channels as well. And um, feel free to reach out to me, Fiona at lawtoland.com or on LinkedIn as well. Excellent, Keith? Yep. Uh, you can see, check out the Overdose website or Keith at overdose.digital and then also LinkedIn works. Wonderful. Amy? Yes. Come visit us. 
visitor.com. Um, we are digital marketing, a full digital marketing agency um, specializing in omni-channel experiences. So check us out if you're interested in any of the service channels. And you can reach out to me at amy at visitor.com with email specific questions. Excellent. Sherry? Yes, you can also reach out to us at hawkmedia.com. Uh, we serve all aspects of digital marketing media where you're outsourced CMO. And if you want to talk to me directly, it's my first initial C and my last name, Selva, at hawkmedia.com. Excellent. And Gabe, you get to go too. Okay. So yeah, I, I work at OmniSend. <laughs> super, super help. It's super glad everyone could join us today, but you can reach me, Gabe, at omnisend.com or Gabe Macaluso on LinkedIn. There's, there's probably just one of us out there. So you, can, you should be able to find me. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And uh, shameless plug for myself as well, also with OmniSend, but please tune into the Card Insiders podcast if you have not yet available on all podcast platforms. Hey guys, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate you going over with me. Uh, I know the audience is uh, super appreciative of it. So thank you for all the insights for carrying the day today. So I didn't have to talk quite as much. So thanks again. And to everyone who joined us today, you guys have a great day. Good luck out there and uh, be kind to one another. Everyone. Thanks. Thanks, guys.